Working Cows Podcast, episode 284. This episode is brought to you by C90 Ocean Minerals. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the C90 Ocean Minerals studios. And this episode is brought to you by C90 Ocean Minerals, the first step in regenerative agriculture. C90 offers a complete spectrum of natural minerals and trace elements to help restore soil fertility and ensure your land remains healthy and productive for generation after generation. Balance mineral chemistry helps optimize your soil matrix so that you can restore topsoil, organic matter, and overall soil resilience. Naturally unlock, locked up, fertilizer nutrients, expand root networks, and invest equally in this season and the ones to come. Give them a call today, and their experts will develop a complimentary custom program that fits your operation. Call 717-580-1458. Or visit c-90.com. Available nationwide and around the world. Very excited to share with you today a recent talk that I gave at the FFA Ag Adventure Zone at the Black Hills Stock Show in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, Went down there and filled the slot for Farm Bureau and uh, shared a little bit about what we can do to have a story worth telling. Too many times, I think, we are told that we have to share our story in agriculture. Well, what are the elements of a good agricultural story that we should be should be telling, and how can we, in a sense, uh, love our non-agricultural neighbors by being good stewards of what we've been entrusted with by God in our uh, resource base of land, animals, people, and money? So uh, this is my talk that I gave at the FFA Ag Adventure Zone at the Black Hills Stock Show in Rapid City, South Dakota. And I'll be back on the back end with a little bit of notes about what's coming up on the Working Cows podcast. So So you've got some sticky notes and some pens on your table. And I want you to write down your guess, unless your dad told you. I want you to write down your guess as to what is agriculture in America's number one export. What is the number one export of agriculture in America? So you've got sticky notes and pens there at your table. Write down your guess as to what you think American agriculture's number one export is. And then bring it up here and stick it on this easel. You guys are welcome to join in, too. I knew I was in western South Dakota. I should have waited till after 105 to start. But So, what we're doing is you've got some pens and sticky notes on your table. I want you to write down what you think American agriculture's number one export is. And bring it up here, just like this fine young gentleman. This up north outlaw himself, brought it up, stuck it on there. While you're doing that, I'm going to give you an outline of my talk today. My goal here today is to make the case that if we all had healthier land, happier families, more profitable businesses, and more content animals, we'd have a better story to tell, right? The title of my talk today is A Story Worth Telling. And if we all had healthier land, happier families, more profitable businesses, and more content animals, we would have a story worth telling, right? So let's look at some of your guesses. Corn, 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 corn. Soybeans, beef, 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 beans. It's all good. It's all good. More beef. More beef. Very good. All very reasonable guesses. All very reasonable guesses. But I don't think that's it. Depending on the measurement you're using. But we're talking exports here. Things that we actually send outside of our country. So if we were talking about silage, right? What's silage weigh per acre? Tons per acre. Like 15 tons an acre. 
is a decent silage crop in eastern South Dakota even, probably better than wouldn't we'd be real happy with that in western South Dakota if we were chopping silage, right? What's the number one export of American agriculture? Topsoil. 5.8 tons per acre on average every year leaves American agriculture in the form of topsoil. 5.8 tons per acre on average. You know what average means, right? Some places are worse than that. Some places are better than that. And this is time for me to make a confession, right? You guys, we had some wind last year, right? It's South Dakota, we have wind, but like we had exceptional wind last year, right? You remember that? You all experienced that? There was dust blowing across the ground at my house too, right? So I'm not here to be the expert and say uh, nobody else is doing it right. I'm just here to say we can do better, and if we do better, we'll have a better story to tell. We'll have more uh, healthy land, more profitable businesses, happier families, and more content animals, right? I need to give a hat tip. It was on that slide a few seconds ago, but I'll give a a tip of the hat to Dave Pratt. Uh, He wrote a book quite a while ago now called Healthy Land, Happy Families, Profitable Businesses. I added the content animals onto it for the purposes of our talk today because as people in agriculture, that's basically the four pillars of your operation. The four pillars of an agricultural operation are land, money, animals, and people. Land, money, animals, and people. Those are the four pillars of your operation. Those are what we want to learn to manage well. Those are what we want to learn to manage better. So, do you you know what this is? You know where this picture comes from? Somebody want to guess where this picture comes from? East River. Sioux Falls. This is a picture from Sioux Falls. This was the dust storm. Happened just last year, right? It's got a funny name. It's called a haboob. I know, it's funny. But check this out. Haboob's phenomena with the unusual name is no joke. NOAA's National Weather Service keeps watchful eye on these massive dust storms. In fact, reading this news article, Haboob's pronounced Haboob's are not unique to America's Sonoran Desert. Now, what's the problem with that sentence? Like, this is a picture from Sioux Falls, and the first line in the article is, that this phenomenon is not limited to what? A desert. I mean, last time I checked, you cross that Missouri River, you start picking up rain pretty quick, right? Not a desert, last time I checked, right? But our practices, the way that we manage our land, our animals, our money, our people, you, I, you heard me say that, right? Our animals are causing this too, not just the people who have bare f- ground in their fields when the wind kicks up. Our animals cause these events too. So they're common in arid regions. It doesn't say anything about a place in the world like Sioux Falls that gets 35 inches of rain a year. It's talking about places that get nine inches of rain per year. And so there's a lot, a lot of moisture that they've got, but they're still having these desert windstorm events happen there. Alan Savory has been telling us for 40 years. Does anybody know who Alan Savory is? Alan Savory has been telling us for 40 years that our agricultural uh, practices cause desertification. Do you know what desertification is? We're making deserts. We're creating deserts with our agricultural practices. It's where the plant spacing gets wider in arid regions. How it happens is plant spacing gets wider. There's more room between plants. There's more bare dirt between the plants. And that's what a desert is, more bare dirt between, from one plant to the next. And so he's been telling us for 40 years that our agricultural practices are causing desertification. And I would say this is proof. In an area where we get 35 inches of rain a year, we're still seeing desertification happen. So we need to figure out how do we manage our land so it's healthier. We're on the healthy land portion of our uh, outline today. I said I was going to talk about healthy land, 
happy families, profitable businesses, and content animals. We're on the healthy land portion of it. So how do we make that happen? How do we make that happen? This is a the, still got the picture in the upper left-hand corner. This is a video from the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition uh, on YouTube. You can look it up, talking about the windstorm from that day. This is a, a soybean field that had been left bare during that windstorm. This is, there's a video that's quite more impactful than this picture, but I wasn't sure what my internet situation would be here today, so I didn't, didn't put a video in my slideshow, just took a screen grab of it. And that's the picture of that dust coming at you off of that field. Here's another picture. Same day, same neighborhood, same wind. Do you notice the difference? It's covered, right? The soil's covered. It's got a green plant in it. There's something growing out there. And that photosynthetic process is holding the soil together. That's what's happening in this picture. Same, same neighborhood, same wind. Same everything. The only difference, what's the difference? What's the difference in these two pictures? Somebody get brave and tell me. What's the difference? Yes. Yes. But the, you're exactly right. And why is that difference there? It's because of management. It's because somebody made a decision. Now, I don't know what the story is with the picture on the right. Could be that guy had a, a family tragedy and he didn't get his cover crop planted. It could be that he had uh, a unique spotty rainstorm. You ever had rain fall at your house that didn't fall at your neighbor's house or vice versa? Could have been a, a unique spotty rainstorm that went through his place and he didn't get his cover crop in. I don't know what the story is. I'm just showing you the picture. This is the same neighborhood, same wind, same day, different story. The difference is management. One person was able to get a cover crop out there, get it growing, get that green plant growing, photosynthetic ha uh, photosynthesis happening, putting out the, the glue of the soil that holds it together. It's a substance called glomalin. If you want to nerd out about that, you can look up Dr. Chris Nichols on YouTube sometime and, and look that up. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play a game. Um, <clears throat> I need some volunteers. And if you don't volunteer, eventually you'll get voluntold. So uh, I need some volunteers who are willing to play along with our game. I'm just going to assign some, assign some roles at random. You're ready to play? You can be our plant. You'll make a good plant, I bet. Somebody else? Thanks. Appreciate it. Can be our root. Another root. Can you pronounce that? Micah Rise Day. It's a fun one. Do you want to be the Kung Fu nematode or the nematode that gets Kung Fu? I'll be the Kung Fu. Oh, of course. I would too. You can be a protozoa. Somebody over here want to get Kung Fu? Oh, you're such a helper. Appreciate it. Bacteria? That little boy wants that too. Oh, Glover, you want to play along? This is my son, Glover, by the way. Appreciate it. There you go. Good. Bacteria. All right. I need my plant helper to come stand right up here in the front and center. I should have told you there was candy involved in volunteering, huh? I didn't tell you that, did I? Forgot that little detail. You hold on to that. Thanks. Appreciate it. These are yours. I'll tell you when to give them to your friends. Okay? All right. So, what is this plant doing? If this is June, we're in June now. Pretend we're in June. Everybody want to be in June? It's nine below outside right now. Who else wants to be in June? I want to be in June. We're in June right now. If we're in June, what's this plant doing right now? He's thriving. He's capturing what? Rain and what else? Sunlight. And what is he doing with that rain and that sunlight? He's growing. Very good. Very good. And where is he putting that rain and that sunlight? It's going where? Up or down? down. Going down. It's en ending up in the roots, right? It's ending up in the roots. He's capturing sunlight and energy, and he's making sugars, and he's turning the sugars into fats and proteins, and all of the things that make up a plant. So what does he do with the, the sugars and the fats? He sends them down through his roots into the soil, and the plant you're such a nice guy, plant. You're going to give some chocolate to our roots. Roots, come on up here. This isn't Jimmy Fallon's band roots either. It's other roots. You don't have to be stingy. I got three bags. 
You can be real generous if you want. So, roots, what do you do with the sugars? Some of them you use to grow, and some of them you leak out into the soil. So go out there a little ways. Hold on to the rope with one hand. I'm sorry, I, you don't have any hands left, do you? Hold on to the rope with one hand. Go out there and leak out some sugars out into the soil. Who eats the sugars? The bacteria. Glover and this fella over here, you come eat the sugar. They're supposed to be leaking for you, leaving it behind on the ground. Yeah, there you go. I made a mess in here earlier. You can follow suit. Bacteria come and they eat the chocolates and they also eat the phosphorus and the nitrogen. So I've got phosphorus and nitrogen cards scattered around. Glover phosphorus starts with a P, even though it says F. Go find the, the green uh, cards that say P on them. With a, start with a P. Pick those up, Glover. You, could, you don't have to hold on to the rope. There you go. Other bacteria, dude, you go pick up the other phosphorus one. And then also the nitrogen. There should be some ones that are red and they start with an N. And they say nitrogen on them. Go pick those up. Bacteria. So you hold on to them. They hold the nutrients. The bacteria hold the nutrients in their body. And they don't release them until they die. So how does the plant get the nutrients? How does a plant get nutrients from bacteria? He's got, he's got phosphorus and nitrogen. We all know nitrogen helps plants go, grow, right? You want to turn your lawn green, go spray some nitrogen on it, boom, right? How do they get nitrogen from the plant if they can't get it till they die? Well, that's because the protozoa eats them. The protozoa goes and eats the, eats the bacteria. Protozoa goes and eats the bacteria. The protozoa arrives and gobbles the nutrients from the hands of the bacteria, the nitrogen, uh, but the bacteria don't leave. There are always so many in the soil. You can never eat them all, Mr. Protozoa. Oh no, he's eaten, he's eaten too many nutrients, the protozoa explains. So now it poops on the roots. Come over here to the roots and drop some of your nutrients. Protozoa arrives, gobbles up the nutrients from the hands of the bacteria. Please do that. But the bacteria don't leave. They're always there. There's so many of them, he can't eat them all. Then he's like, oh no, he's eaten too many of them. So he comes and poops the nutrients on the roots. You see how this is working? We've got this whole underground black market going on. And does our bacteria poop is, yeah, nutrients, go. Do it. Thank you. So then uh, he gives the nutrients to the roots. The roots pass the nutrients to the plant. Roots are going to pass the nutrients to the plant. And the bacteria pick up the uh, nitrogen and the phosphorus on the ground. There's another predator who eats bacteria and protozoa, and that's the good nematode. Good nematode. It's you're up, buddy. I can eat 5,000 bacteria in an hour. Watch out. The nematode bottle gobbles up the bacteria and takes the nitrogen and the phosphorus cards. So you guys give your nitrogen and phosphorus to the good nematode. The nutrients are imbalanced for what I need, so I need to get rid of some. So he comes over to the root and he vomits out his phosphorus and his nitrogen. Mr. Good Nematode, we need you to come puke on the roots. Drop your phosphorus and your nitrogen on the roots. There are some microbes that like to eat roots, including uh, root-feeding nematodes. Bad nematode. You look delicious, Mr. Root. Where's my bad nematode? You look delicious, Mr. Root, he says. So, but the good nematode says, no way. The root feeds all the bacteria I need to eat. So no way I'm going to let you get close. So the good nematode kung fu's the bad nematode back to the edge of the room. Get after it. You said you wanted the kung fu roll. You got to kung fu him back to the edge of the room. There we go. There we go. All right. Very good. There's a very important fungus that lives in uh, and on plant roots. It's the mycorrhizae. This young lady here, she, she travels much further into smaller spaces than plant roots can reach. The mycorrhizae connects the string to the plant root and takes a handful of chocolate from the root. Go ahead and act this out while I'm talking through it. And rolls out the string heading as far as the string goes. So you can take the end of that rope and go as far as it'll go. But she can go farther than you, Root, so you can stay there. She can go farther than you. As the mycorrhizae walks and drops out chocolate along the string, pick up uh, the images off the floor, a water drop and zinc 
and nitrogen and phosphorus. She takes the sugars and the fats, which are the types of carbon deeper into the soil, and uses them to buy water, phosphorus, uh, water and phosphorus deep in the soil. The mycorrhizae brings the water and mineral back to the plant root. And uh, nitrogen, uh, what does the plant do with the water and the nutrients? What do you do with water and nutrients, plant? He grows. Yes, he nailed it. But there are things that we can do that reduce these natural cycles. What do you think some of those things that would reduce these natural cycles are? Soluble fertilizers. Pesticides, fungicides. You know, I said mycorrhiza fungi. That's a fungus, a fungus. When you put fungicide out, you kill fungus, right? So, fungicide. Uh, these things are all um, bare ground, herbicides, overgrazing, cultiva- uh, cultivation, water logging, too much water. All those things cause issues with these natural processes. When we use soluble fertilizers, the plant says it doesn't need, uh, doesn't need to feed the mycorrhizal fungi anymore. The root drops the mycorrhizae. Uh, roll up the string, the good protozoa. When people cultivate and chop up the soil, we also cut up the home. So mycorrhizae, you can go sit down. Good proto- or protozoa, you can go sit down. Uh, the good neme- when, when people use herbicides and pesticides, they kill the good nematodes. Good nematode, you can go sit down. Bad nematode, what does that mean for you? Now there's no one left to protect the plant root, so I can come and eat the roots. Yum, 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 he says. The roots go and sit down. Now all that is left is bacteria and root-feeding nematodes. What will a farmer have to do now? Here comes our salesman, right? Our trusty salesman. Don't panic, he says. I'm here to save the day. You can buy irrigation equipment from me. I have fertilizers and pesticides to sell you too. This is how the uh, this is now the place most farms and ranches are around the world. Modern farming practices have cut our vital soil partners, and as a consequence of this, we are losing soil at a dramatic rate, with impacts on water quality and reduced nutrient quality of food. To uh, farm with resilience, health, and profitability, we need to rebuild the microbial bridge. Thank you, guys, very much. Give them a hand. Appreciate their help. So, do you see how we had this whole place? You can just leave that there. I'll trip over it. It'll be hilarious. Um, Do you see how we had this whole place kind of filled up with different characters, right? We had this whole place filled up with different soil characters, didn't we? But what happened? What happened to all our characters? You like that lead core rope? You can throw that sucker a mile. If it was that long. Throw that football over to mountains over there. Anyways, um, no, 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 uh, you know what, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Uncle Rico, huh? All right. Anyways, um, what happened? We killed all of the people helping us out underground. It was, it was a uh, Napoleon Dynamite reference. Yeah. She wasn't going to hear anything else I said until I cleared that up. Uh, We killed off all of our underground soil partners, didn't we? Uh, All that was left was bacteria and root-feeding nematodes. And so then we had to rely on the salesman. And I don't have the graph in my my slideshow today, but I would show you a graph that shows the profit in agriculture. And over the last 40 years, all of the profit in agriculture has ended up in in the pockets of those salesmen. The guys that are selling you uh, irrigation equipment, the guys that are selling you um, uh, fertilizers and pesticides, all the money, all the money made in agriculture in the last 40 years has gone to them. But we've, God has designed a system of underground, an underground network that works if we'll just let it do its thing, right? We need to, we need to use our management skills to do a better job of letting those, uh, letting those, Organisms underground do their thing, and that's what we're supposed to be doing as good managers. So, six principles of soil health. Does anybody know any of these? They're not going to be in the order you name them, probably. So, if, if I just let you name them off, they're going to come up in not that order. But, does anybody know one of them? Any one of the six principles of soil health? 
Does anybody sit in on the Soil Health Coalition talk that was earlier today? No? 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 All right. Six principles of soil health. First one is context. Context. What does that mean? What has happened on this land in the past? Also, how much rain do I get a year? Uh, what kind of soils do I have? Those are all going to affect your management decisions. Those are all going to affect what you do on your land. All of those things, context, is going to affect what you do on your land. Number two, and this is the most important one, armor on the soil. What's armor on the soil? I could take you back to that picture and show you, right? That guy had cover on the soil. And, it, and it's the more the better until you get about more than a big double handful when you scoop up all the armor on the soil between your boots when you're standing like this. If you've got more than a big double handful, maybe you've got too much. But until then, you don't have enough. So the more the better, armor on the soil. What does that do? What's the armor on the soil do? Keeps the soil cool. Why is cool soil important? Because it helps our bacteria and our nematodes, our good nematodes and our protozoa to th and our mycorrhizae to, f to thrive, right? Those underground soil partners are the best employees you'll ever have. They will work 24-7 until they die, and all you have to do is provide for them a place to live. And you provide for them a place to live by putting a roof over the head. What's the roof over their head? Cover, armor on the soil, okay? Reduce disturbance, chemical and mechanical, right? It wasn't just the, the tillage that affects those underground soil partners. It's chemicals also, kills bacteria, fungicides, kill fungus, right? Uh, chemicals killed the protozoa. The fourth principle is diversity of roots. We want to have a diversity of roots in the soil. We want to have room uh, for the soil, or we want to have different things growing at different times because different grasses, different plants have different seasons of growth. And so if they're growing at one time when something else isn't growing, they're still photosynthesizing. They're still putting those fats and proteins into the soil that the bacteria and everybody else can come out and use and trade nutrients. It was an underground black market, wasn't it? They were trading nutrients out there, right? So... We want, to, we want to keep diversity of roots in the soil so that at different times of year, when some things are not growing, other things are there and they're growing still. Living roots as long as possible. Did you know that there are roots that will continue to photosynthesize even into this time of year? Even now, there's people who have cover crops in the ground that are still very slowly. It's very slow, but it's still happening and it's still uh, doing work. And then the final one is incorporate livestock. Every acre of agricultural land in America, if I had my way, would have livestock on it at least some point in the year. If I could, if somebody said, what's one thing you could do, would do to improve agriculture in America? I'd say let's put livestock on every acre at least once a year, at least for some portion of every year. Why? Because you'd have to have something out there for them to eat. They'd either waste it and it'd leave cover or it would be a living root and, the, and then so we're accomplishing more than just one of those things. But what happens, you drive by, by a lot of fields, even hay fields. I bet some of you probably have hay fields that don't have a fence around them because they never get cows on them, right? Again, this isn't an East River, West River thing. This isn't a farmers or bad ranchers or good thing. It's agriculture can do better. And if we do better, we have a better story to tell, right? People will want to listen, want to hear our story. All right, we're off the first one. Healthy land is the first one. Second one is happy families. This is my ranch. This is an actual picture of my ranch that my wife took. This is my legacy. These guys are sitting right here. Tez is not one of mine. I would claim her. I'd take her if, if she was needing a place to go. But she's not one of mine. But these guys, this is my legacy. This is a hat tip. It's not on the screen today, but it's a hat tip to Jared Nock. I heard him give this talk one time, the difference between your farm and your legacy. He says farm because he's from East River, but the difference between my ranch and my legacy. Which one do you think I'd let you take first? Which one do you think I'd let the bank have first? The ranch. All day, every day, I'll, you'd have it. 
If it comes to me, if it comes down to me choosing between my ranch and my family, I will choose my family every single day of the week. Eight days a week, right? Our greatest fear, this is a D.L. Moody quote, our greatest fear should not be failure, but succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. Our greatest fear should not be failure, but succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. If I succeed at ranching, if my, my ranch is the healthiest ranch in my neighborhood, but my kids hate me and ranching, I've failed. So we want to make sure that we're succeeding at things that really matter. We're going to work through a passage of scripture now, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. It's just about how to handle conflict. Somebody else has probably quoted Simon Sinek or T.S. Eliot or John Steinbeck or something here today. If they can quote those guys, I can quote Jesus, right? So, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's the first thing we need to notice, between you and him alone. When you're mad at somebody, how often do you go and talk to somebody else about it before you talk to the person you're actually mad at? Right? Guilty. Been there. Done that. Right? You go talk to them first. Right? If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear, you take one or two more. Then you go to them with somebody else and says, hey, it's not just me that thinks you're a jerk. This person also thinks that you uh, crossed the line there. Right? We, we agree. I'm not just being a jerk. He agrees that there, there was something uh, wrong done there as well. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear you, tell it to the church or the family, the group. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be a heathen, like a heathen and a tax collector to you. You treat him, you hold him at arm's length. You don't uh, bring him in. You don't give him uh, ability to make decisions that affect the rest of the family, if we're talking about a family business here. And then the last line in this, in this passage is, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Jesus is saying, usually in in church world, we usually use this as an excuse to have a small Bible study. Like three people showed up, so we're like, well, where two or three are gathered, Jesus says he's there in our midst. But what he's actually saying is that interpersonal conflict is so hard that you need the presence of God to help you do it. That's what Jesus is actually saying in this passage. And so we have families we have family conflict, we have issues in our families, and I think if we handled them according to this outline, we would be a lot more successful, but ultimately, if we invited God to help us, we would probably be still more successful yet, but uh, when we don't handle it this way, when we go and talk to somebody else about that person that offended us before we go and talk to them, then we invite a lot more conflict, we invite a lot more issues. And so I think that this is a good and helpful outline and we should consider using it in our interpersonal conflict. Anybody ever had a fight on the ranch? (laughs) Yes, me too. All right. And uh, when we don't handle it this way, sometimes things get worse instead of better. Okay. All right. I want to do one more thing before we move on from, uh, from families. So I told you earlier that Alan Savory's been telling us we've co- we're causing desertification for years. None of you knew who that was, so I'm sure you don't know who Stan Parsons is either. But Alan Savory and Stan Parsons came to America in the 1980s from Africa, and they started teaching people about how to manage grass and cattle and crops and livestock and people and all these things. But they came from Africa, so they had a lot, a lot of exposure to... Uh, tribal living in Africa. And in tribal living in Africa, a lot of meals are cooked around a a large kettle, right? This huge kettle, like the size of this this table would be the opening of that kettle. And so we've got this kettle. And those kettles are supported by three legs. There's a a three-legged support system under this kettle, right? What are, these, what, are, what are the three legs if we're talking about the kettle is our, our ranch? What are, I've already told you, right, what those were, what three of the four were. What are they? They are land. What else? What? No, we're going land, 
money, animals, and then where are the people? They're in the pot. The people are in the pot, okay? You like my people? Kind of looks like a duck or a chicken or something. I don't know. Anyways, so what happens when we get our land, our money, and our, our uh, animals if we're not managing them properly? One of the legs breaks off, right? Then what happens? The people end up in the fire, right? Pot tips over. People end up in the fire. So we need to manage our, we need to manage our resources right so our people don't get hurt. Right? We want to have healthy land, and we want to have happy families. Next is profitable businesses. A lot of times we talk about ranching being a great lifestyle, right? We love to, uh, to ride and rope and hammer and paint and do things with our hands that most men can't. No, nobody. Who sang that? That is older than them. It's true. It's a song. It's a song. Uh, we like the lifestyle, though, right? We like the agricultural lifestyle. Yes or no? Don't like it? Do like it. Yes? Like it. Wouldn't be an FFA if you didn't, right? It's a great lifestyle. But it's also a lifestyle at which you can make a great living. You can do really well financially in this lifestyle. Does anybody believe that? It's like, eh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's true. You can. And I'm not, that's, I'm not going to have time to develop that. Just... I'm not going to have time to develop that today. Did you have a question? No? Okay. I'm not going to have time to develop that necessarily today, but I want you to know it is true. It, it isn't just a lifestyle. We don't have to just say, it's a great lifestyle, so I can, I can put up with not making much money. It's a great lifestyle, and you can make good, a good living at this lifestyle. How do we do it? Just real quickly, real quickly. How do we make a great living? First of all, we find our unfair advantage. What would be an example of an unfair advantage in our neighborhood? In our neighborhood, I think Black Hills Forest Service leases are a great example of an unfair advantage. If you live close enough to the Forest Service to get a Forest Service lease, you can run cows very, very affordably up there. And that's an example of an unfair advantage. Some people who live next to a city, the city is their unfair advantage. They can sell uh, holes, halves, cuts of meat, ground beef for way more than they would get per pound at the sale barn if they just finish those animals and take them all the way to slaughter and develop a market. Now, none of it's easy. I didn't say it was easy. Did I say it was easy? I didn't say it was easy. I just said it was possible. You can make good money, but I didn't say it was going to be easy. So it's hard, but you've got to choose the kind of hard you want. Is it the kind of hard where we eke by and, and barely make our payments? Or is it the kind of hard where I have to deal with people at the farmer's market every Saturday to sell my beef? It's just a different kind of hard, right? We've got to choose which kind of hard we want. Ranch and sink with God's provision is the next one. So we, we uh, find out when is the most available, uh, most uh, easily acquired uh, forage available. And we say, let's match the nutrient needs of our animals to when the most easily available forage is in our neighborhood. And it's going to be different everywhere. And we need to do the numbers and figure it out. But it's, it's op, it's, it is possible. I know lots of people, even in our neighborhood, who have gone years, years without feeding any hay to their cattle. Because their cattle, uh, because they've timed their uh, nutrient requirements of their cattle with the way that the land grows and they are doing it year after year consistently able to get their cows through without any hay find a way to reduce dependence on machinery remember what i told you about ranch business the ranch business has uh the the sorry the agricultural business their profits have gone up while our share as people who are actually producing the food has gone down. We need to find a way to reduce dependence on machinery. We need to find a way to get by with fewer pieces of metal on our operations. That's one of the keys. There are many other ways to do it, and there are people doing it in a totally different way than I have described here who are making good livings. 
All I want to tell you is that it's possible to have a profitable business and to make a good living in agriculture, but you've got to figure out how you can make it work. Content animals. Let's do another survey. We can use the back side of this for our survey. I want you to write down the most stressful day on your ranch or farm. What's the most stressful day of the year on your family's ranch or farm? I will resist the temptation to give you some hints. Good? All right. Let's, let's look at some of our responses. Working cows. Calving season. Day before we start combining. Working cows. Working cows. Preg checking. Fall born sale. Uh, combining grains or haying. Working cattle. Working cows on a time limit. Branding. Feeding and uh, feeding a work crew. AIing season, fencing, kidding. Somebody raising goats? Oh, okay. I was like, wow, somebody else has goats. This is my family. Uh, I think I got them all. All right. Working cattle. Most consistent response, right? We had others, but the most consistent response was the day when we're going to cram all of our cattle into a uh, into a set of pens, and we're going to try and get them moved up an alleyway through a chute, do something, right? Preg checking, uh, AIing, uh, preconditioning, weaning, working cattle, right? Content animals. Somebody describe a content animal. What? Do you, how? Would, what are? What's one way you could look at an animal and dis- and say that's a content animal? Anybody? Eating. What does it have to do to have to eat? It has to put its head down, right? If their head is down, they're probably content, right? If their head is up, not so much content, right? Kit Farrow is a bull breeder from Colorado. He talks about the periscope syndrome that bulls have. Is that a, is that a happy bull, content bull? No, that's a bull looking to kill someone, <laughs> right? Tez knows about bulls, She's, but they have really gentle bulls. I helped, helped uh, freeze brand at their house last year and it was, it was a good day. It was a good day. Content animals. So, content animals. Healthy land, happy families, profitable businesses, content animals. Did you know it is possible? If an animal isn't content, is it gaining weight? Is it gaining weight if it is not content? No. Did you know it is possible for your calves to gain weight on the day that they are weaned from their mothers? Would you say that that's the most stressful day of that calf's life, especially if it's a heifer calf? I mean, the steer calf, he had a pretty stressful day come June, right? That was a pretty bad day in his life. But would you say that that's the most stressful day in the calf's life is when you, when you wean him or her from their mother? I would say so. Just think about the amount of noise at your place on the day when you wean calves from cows. How noisy is that day? There's another sign of a content animal. They're quiet. They're on, they are not content if they're making noise. They're content if their head's down. They're content if they're quiet. Not content if they are making noise. So just measure it that way. They are content. Have I ever weaned a calf that gained weight while it was being weaned? No, probably not. Because I haven't mastered this yet. Again, back to that whole I'm not an expert thing. I'm just somebody who's talked to a lot of experts and they've told me these things. The guy that told me this is a guy by the name of Dr. Tom Singer, who is a legend from Nebraska in the world of stockmanship and handling cattle. And he said, we have measured it. We have measured it, and we have handled cattle in such a way that calves have gained, wheat on, gained weight on the day they were weaned from their mothers. So if it's possible, somebody's doing it, right? Or if somebody's doing it, it's possible. So we shouldn't discount it. Just because it sounds far-fetched, we should say, oh, if it's possible, maybe somebody is doing it. So, title of my talk, A Story Worth Telling. The title of my talk was A Story Worth Telling. Maybe, maybe you ended up here because you didn't want to judge. I don't know. But A Story Worth Telling is a story that where you have healthier land, a happier family, 
a more profitable business, and more content animals. To the outside world, this, the, the topic I was broadly assigned was advocacy. And one of the things that frustrates me about advocacy in agriculture is they just tell us to tell our story. But they don't even tell us what parts of the story we should be telling. And so I've tried to cover a good, uh, a good summary of the four facets of an agricultural business and talk about how we can have a story that's more worth telling. We could make our land healthier. We could make our, our family happier. You know, I grew up, I didn't like ranching. I, I, don't know if, I don't know if my circulation didn't work until I was 25 or if, or if boots and gloves got better after I turned 25. But all I remember about ranching as a kid is that my hands and my feet were always cold and I hated it. Right? So I moved away, went to Milwaukee, lived in Milwaukee for a couple of years. I still remember the time I was driving home from Milwaukee and I got out of my car to fill it up with gas somewhere probably in Wall or Western South Dakota somewhere. And I got a whiff of fresh air after living in Milwaukee and then being in a car with my own stink for 11 hours. Like, I'm like, ooh, fresh air. This smells better than Milwaukee. I think I could, I think I could live here. And that's what started bringing me back into this business of ranching and making me want to do it uh, of my own choice, not because somebody forced me to. But we can have a better story to tell, a better story. It, would it be more attractive if people drove by our land and they didn't have to drive through a brownout on a windy day because the soil was blowing across the road? Would it be more attractive if uh, they saw our kids and our families and they saw, oh, they're, that's a happy family, they're enjoying life? That looks like a good uh, business to be in. Would it be a good uh, thing if they saw that we, were, uh, that we were not just squeaking by, but we had money and we were able to enjoy a comfortable standard of living? It would be a good story to tell, wouldn't it? Would it be a good story to tell if we had content animals and they could tell that our animals were handled with care and our animals were never uh, stressed and worked up? Those are good stories. Those are good parts of our story, and we can figure out ways to make those parts of our story better, and then we can figure out a way to tell those stories to people around us. So, any questions? No questions. But uh, I appreciate you guys paying attention. I appreciate you guys participating in my surveys. Uh, and, yeah. Appreciate, appreciate your time today. So thank you guys. And this episode is brought to you by C90 Ocean Minerals, the first step in regenerative agriculture. C90 offers a complete spectrum of natural minerals and trace elements to help restore soil fertility and ensure your land remains healthy and productive for generation after generation. Balance mineral chemistry helps optimize your soil matrix so that you can restore topsoil, organic matter, and overall soil resilience. Naturally unlock, locked up, fertilizer nutrients, expand root networks, and invest equally in this season and the ones to come. Give them a call today, and their experts will develop a complimentary custom program that fits your operation. Call 717-580-1458. Or visit c-90.com. Available nationwide and around the world. Very much appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate Farm Bureau thinking of me to come in and fill that slot. I was uh, excited to do it. Looking forward to next week on the Working Cows podcast. I'll be talking to Elaine Fraze. Elaine, of course, been a guest many times over the last couple of years. I've uh, been talking to her about handling uh, people and our relationships in the ranching businesses that we are overseeing. And we're going to talk to her about living the intentional life and, uh, and understanding what stage of life we're in and how we should uh, be 
making sure that we're getting the most out of that stage of life that we're in so that we can move on to the next stage and be successful there. And uh, just talking about living the intentional life, making sure that we are paying attention to the things that are going on around us and not just floating through and letting things happen to us, but proactively taking uh, a management stance in our life. So uh, looking forward to that. We'll see you again real soon on another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.